This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network. Visit JabberjawMedia.com for more shows like this one. Episode number 99 of that one time on tour is brought to you by the band Fake News. Fake News is a punk band from Gold Coast, Australia. Formed in late 2017, Fake News released their first single two months later and played their first show at their guitarist Mix House opening for Guttermouth. With a sound reminiscent of the 90s punk heyday, the band draws influences from fat and epitaph bands with a little heavy metal thrown in for good measure. For more information on Fake News, you can check them out at fakenews.bandcamp.com or on Facebook at Fake News Punk. Now here it is, their new single, In the Grind Pit. Everybody out there in podcast land, what is going on? As always, this is Chris Swinney, your host for that one time on tour. If this is your first time joining me, this is my podcast where I get to sit down with somebody in or around the entertainment industry and have a stellar conversation. Thank you so much for last week. My guest was John Tuttle from the band Code 7, and uh, you guys seem to really enjoy it. I got some really good feedback, so thanks for checking that out. I'm really hoping that Furnace Fest happens. I know it's kind of far away, but uh, all of the festivals and everything have been closing down for this pandemic that we're having. 
And uh, Code 7, one of the reunion shows, is going to be at Furnace Fest down in Alabama. So make sure to get your tickets now for that. And hopefully, fingers crossed, the uh, coronavirus will not affect Furnace Fest because there's some amazing bands playing down there. Uh, This week on the program, I get to chat with Mr. Zach Quinn from the awesome band Pears. Uh, They have a new self-titled release out on Fat Records. It came out earlier this month. And uh, we did this interview before the record came out, so we talk about it kind of being in the future, but it's out now, and uh, you guys need to check it out. There's a three on the cover. We talk about, you know, is this called three? No, it's the self-titled Pairs record, but uh, it is the third record. So check that out on Spotify and everywhere else, or pick up a copy at the Fat Records website. And uh, man, this virus is just crazy. I've been doing so many interviews because I'm self quarantining, you know, I'm here in my house with my wife and my son and my daughter. And, uh, I've almost been doing an interview every day cause I'm not working. And the weird thing is like, no one is playing shows. No one's touring or doing anything, but publicists have been hitting me up like crazy. They're like, Hey, do you want to do this, 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 this? So I've been filling up everything, man. Like if, if the podcast was, a well-paying job. I'd, I'd be killing it during the coronavirus, but uh, I'm having a good time with it. I'm trying to bank as many interviews as possible so I can keep the content coming out to you guys during this crazy time in our world. And uh, I was talking to my wife earlier and we were watching this TV show and they were saying that this is like the worst, the worst kind of thing and like, like economical thing to happen since World War II. And it's, it's strange to think that we're living through something like this, you know, like I remember when 9-11 happened, I had just gotten home from a tour, I'd, we'd driven all the way back from Dallas, Texas to Indiana, and I was living at my mom's house, and I went to sleep on my little punk rock bed that didn't have a box spring, it was just a mattress on the floor in this room, and she comes in and wakes me up a half hour later, and she's like, oh, we're being attacked, and I just remember how weird that was, and watching the TV like every day after that, just like not sleeping, not eating. And then this is kind of like that. And there's no end in sight. That's the scary thing about this. You know, I've been on edge quite a bit. My wife has as well. And it's, it's just, it's the not knowing it's not knowing when I'm going to get to go back to work. It's not knowing if we're going to be in the house until the middle of the summer. It's, and then not even knowing if this is the new norm, you know what I mean? Like, if I, I'm a hugger, I hug people all the time. I, I shake hands all the time. Am I not going to be able to do that anymore? It's, it's just, it's scary. And, uh, I know a lot of you guys out there are dealing with it as well. And, uh, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying safe and just don't go outside. Don't do anything. Just stay in and use this time to be creative. That's, that's what you could do with this. You always, everybody always talks about needing more time. Well, now you got the time. So go ahead and do it. So uh, I got to tell you guys about my sponsors for this week's episode. Fake News, amazing band out of Australia, Gold Coast, Australia. You got to check them out. Fake News. Let me see the little website here. Fakenews.bandcamp.com or on Facebook at Fake News Punk. Uh, Permanence Tattoo Gallery over in Anderson, Indiana on Meridian Street. It's where I get my ink done. It's where you need to get your ink done. So hit them up on the socials at Permanence Tattoo Gallery and head on over when all this stuff goes away and get some tattoos, man. Uh, Merge 4. They make socks. They make the best socks. They're amazing. Check them out, Merge4.com. And if you guys want to buy some stuff from Merge 4, hit me up. I will send you a promo code for 50% off your order. That is 50, 50% off your order. So check them out over at merge4.com and tell them that TOTOT sent you. A new sponsor we've had on for a couple episodes, Start Famous. Uh, go, over, go on over to startfamous.com. They're an awesome merch print shop out of Canada, and they can do anything you want. They've got the highest quality, the fastest turnaround. They've really taken care of us. They sent me a little gift bag with some really cool stuff. I got a hoodie. And uh, they sent this trucker cap and I gave it to my son and he loves it. He won't give it back to me. So hit up startfamous.com. And when you check out, when you're ordering your merch, put in the promo code TOTOT10. That is TOTOT10 to get 10% off your order. If you have a band or a company and you would like to become a sponsor, you can hit me up, TOTOT podcast at gmail.com. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm cutting super, super crazy coronavirus discounts if you want to become a sponsor. So hit me up. I've got some amazing episodes coming up that need some sponsors. So hit me up and we will take care of that. If you do not have a band or a company and you would still like to support the show, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash TOTOT podcast and get involved there. We have two new patrons this week. I need to give shout outs to Michael Crosby from the United Kingdom and Justin from I have no idea because he signed up under Justin. That's it. So shout out to Michael Crosby over in England and Justin, wherever you live. Thank you so much for sponsoring. Here's, here's a little, little claps for you guys. Thank you so much. And also our two Patreon producers, Bob Foster from Hemet, California, and John Exton from Stafford, England. Thank you guys so much. It means the world to me, especially in these crazy times. And uh, you guys help the show, and I appreciate it so much. It's, it's great. I couldn't do it without you guys. So that is it for the sponsors. Thank you guys for listening to that. And please check my sponsors out. I know there's not a lot of extra money going around right now, but uh, if you guys want some really cool stuff, my sponsors are amazing companies and they they support the underground music scene and they support this show and you guys should support them. Okay, so I have a pretty cool radio segment this week, so hit the theme music. Radio, 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 radio. When I've got the music, I've got the place to go. On this edition of TOTOT Radio, I've got a really cool one for you guys. And yes, it is coronavirus pandemic themed. Uh, my good buddy, Mr. Dan Precision from the amazing band 88 Fingers Louie. Uh, he used to be in Rise Against as well. He uh, put this really cool thing up on Facebook, actually on YouTube, but he shared it on Facebook. He took the Blondie classic song, Call Me. He recorded all the instruments at his home studio, the bomb shelter, and uh, he called it quarantine instead of call me, changed all the lyrics. It's really, really cool. He, he sang everything, did harmonies, played guitar, bass, drums, and there's a really cool video on YouTube where you can kind of see him doing everything. There's lights and everything. And I got to say, my old band, Chronic Chaos, when I met Dan back in the day, I had an 88 Fingers Louie tattoo. I used to go see them all the time when they'd come into Indiana. And then <clears throat> I met him at Warp Tour hanging out. He wasn't playing. He was just there. And I was there when I was a lot younger. And I gave him a demo of my old band, Chronic Chaos. And he said, hey, I'd like to work with you guys. And we actually did two full-length CDs at his home studio, The Bomb Shelter, up in Chicago. So if any of you guys are looking to have anything mixed or mastered or do some recording or whatever, hit up Dan, Mr. Dan Precision. Uh, you can just Google The Bomb Shelter Chicago. It'll come up. And uh, he's a great dude. And I thought this was amazing. And it made it made my day. And right now with everything that's going on, it's it's great to see all my friends being so creative. There's so many amazing podcasts and amazing musicians out there. Everybody's doing live streams and it's it's kind of a cool time because you're forced inside. So you're forced to kind of make stuff. And that's exactly what Dan did. And I just want to give a shout out to Dan and all the other guys in 88 Fingers Louie as well. Hope to have you guys back on the show soon. But until then, I want you guys to enjoy this. This is Dan's take on the Blondie classic, Call Me. It is entitled Quarantine, and it is very, very much themed for the times we're going through right now. So here we go.
It was Quarantine by Mr. Dan Precision of 88 Fingers Louie. So uh, I just want to say, Dan, that's awesome. I love it so much. I hope you don't get mad that I played it on the show as I didn't ask permission. But uh, I highly doubt that you ask Blondie's permission to uh, change the lyrics. So go ahead and check that out on YouTube. It's got crazy a crazy amount of plays on YouTube. Just search Dan Precision uh, Quarantine and it should come up. But that is it for the intro, guys and girls. Remember, you can follow us on all the social media platforms at T-O-T-O-T Podcast. Make sure, if you want to help the show out, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen. That is the cheapest, it's free, and easiest way to help the show out. But without further ado, I'm going to jump right into my conversation with Zach Quinn from Pears. It's a good one. I hope you guys like it. Here we go. And I'm on the line with Mr. Zach Quinn from the awesome band Pairs. How you doing today, Zach? I'm doing all right, man. I'm actually currently walking down uh, Franklin Avenue, going to the uh, to the bar. Oh, cool. Are you you're in New Orleans, right? Yeah. Are you born and raised in New Orleans, or is that like a newer place you've lived? Oh no, born and raised. I uh, haven't really lived anywhere else. Uh, I've stayed a couple places for weeks at a time, but never a full on resident. You know. So I, I always had a question because I lived in Gulf Shores, Alabama for a while. We used to go to New Orleans all the time, like on the weekends. Oh, and sure. Yeah. The the tourists annoyed the shit out of me. So I'd like to know from someone that's local, when you go down to like Bourbon Street, how annoyed are you with the people? Oh, yeah. Here's the thing. I don't go down to fucking Bourbon Street. OK, uh-uh, that's that's like that's like uh yeah, that's, that's like a 10-foot a stick away from anywhere I would ever go to. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, they drive me nuts, too. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, they, 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 there absolutely is, like, the absence of, like, general rule here, but there yeah. is etiquette, and, and it seems like they understand the first half, but not the second half. So how close do you live to, like, the French Quarter? I'm always amazed by people that actually live in that. And then in that city, I have a lot of friends that went there, like, moved there to work in the service industry. But, like, people sure, that, yeah. that grow up there, like, where exactly are you at in the city? Uh, I live in the St. Rock neighborhood, uh, which is, I guess, I mean, I can walk to the French Quarter. It takes about 20 minutes, probably. Uh, but, uh yeah, I don't, I don't ever go much down there. Um, and especially like people that live in the French quarter, like that's some pricey, uh, yeah. real estate. Yeah, definitely, um, man. 
Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, I just grew up actually in the St. Rock area. Um, after a certain point, I was like bouncing around when I was young because my parents divorced and I lived in a bunch of different houses, but uh, eventually settled at my grandparents' house. So were you affected? I mean, I know you probably were. Most people were by Hurricane Katrina when that hit down there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know people, uh, plenty of people that were far more affected than I was. Um, I was essentially just displaced for a little while. Uh, and our house had gotten eight and a half feet of water. Uh, but we live on the second story and the water had come up to the second to last stair. Wow. So, I mean, we, it was a close call for us. Essentially once uh power was back on, it was like nothing happened aside from the fact that the downstairs was just gutted out completely, but we never went down there anyway. Was the city just like in shambles? Just like when you like watching it from the TV, it's, it just looked insane. Like what was the general like vibe for you when that was all going on? Oh man, it was, it was an absolute fucking nightmare. I mean, it was, it, and it was super fucking eerie when we got back. Cause I mean, luckily like we're, a, you know, uh, my family has been long established in the neighborhood. And so we were a little better off than a lot. I mean, most of the people in this neighborhood are like very low income, like hanging on by the skin of their teeth. Uh, so we were able to go back to the neighborhood before like anybody else was. So it was like a ghost town, man. I mean, no. And when we first got back, like no uh, street lights, no nothing, just complete black wow. and nobody. And it was, yeah, it was really, really eerie. So everybody that I've known that grew up in that area, they have this, uh, this like affinity for their hometown. And I know that, you know, being in a band and, you know, I was in a band, I traveled all the time. I know you go all over the world when you're, when you're touring, has there ever been a place that you've seen that you thought maybe you would want to live or is it New Orleans forever for you? Um, there definitely have been places that I, uh, I've thought about living. Um, I real, it's not uh, terribly realistic for me. I'm not too, too well off on money. Relocating is kind of a really difficult concept, but there are places absolutely that I would live. Yeah. Though I don't know if I like any city in the world as much as I like my hometown. Well, that's, that's awesome, man. That's, that's, that's kind of the general consensus when I talk to people that grew up there, you know? Yeah. I, I, and I, I really can't tell whether it's because I just love it so much or whether this place is so fucked up that I don't know if I could function anywhere else because <laughs> yeah. like my, 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 le my standard of living is so bizarre, not low or high, but just strange. Um, yeah, I'm not sure it would fly anywhere else. Well, and, and it's, it's such a good music city. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say it's maybe the best punk rock music city, but there is such like no. a culture and, you know, with the Cajun music and all that stuff. How did you, you know, when you were younger, get into kind of the counterculture, like punk rock thing? How did that come into your life? Um, honestly, I mean, it's kind of, I feel like it's kind of a, a, a repetitive story uh, as far as like people that came up at the time that I did. Yeah. Because um, at that point, you know, music was far less regional. It's even less regional now. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, like there are bands now that, you know, 30 years ago would have had to have been from the West Coast. And now it's like they could be from anywhere in sound anyhow. Yeah, there used there used to be a definite like if you heard that West Coast fat wreck epitaph kind of thing, you knew where they were from. But now it's completely right. different. Yeah. Yeah. The Internet changed everything. I mean, like the fact that you can uh, you have access to music from all over the world, anywhere in the world uh, is has changed the game. But so. With that said, I mean, I got into, into the shit the same way that a lot of people did, you know, finding like the mainstream stuff that had just broken in the 90s uh, and then kind of falling down a, a rabbit hole from there. So what were some of those first bands, like not maybe the mainstream bands that kind of spoke to you? Um, well, uh, the whole, I, I mean, essentially, like it, it'd be hard to name just one, but I can tell you a, like the fat epitaph like roster. Okay. Uh, cause one serious, uh, thing to, I guess, mention was that was the time of the $3 comp. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember that. that we talk about that on this program all the time. If, if I didn't have those early fat comps and punk aramas, I don't know if I would even be doing what I'm doing, you know? Right. Same. Uh, it was such like a, an easy way to be exposed to so many things all at once. Um, which I guess like it was a good, uh, it, it was a good double for the internet back then. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, those just kind of 
started piling up and then you know you picked out the uh the handful of bands that you liked the most and started getting full lengths by those bands and for me that was you know lag wagon no effects uh bad religion uh you know i mean the standards uh and then from there i got really heavy into 80s hardcore oh that's cool man how old are you by the way i'm 31 31 man you're you're a baby i'm 41 (laughs) right on right on (laughs) no i'm sure you don't feel like a baby but like it's funny like for the last few weeks i've been talking to people that are my age if not like 10 years older (laughs) right right nice to have a a youngster on the show if i can call you that but uh, sure no absolutely i'll take it man that's Uh, i i I pulled my back putting on a sock the other day so i'll absolutely take it dude the, the other day I came out of the I came out of the bathroom and my wife had mopped the floor and I went completely like horizontal and hit the ground and I thought I was going to die. I thought I had to go to the hospital, man. It, when you get older, Jesus sucks. Christ. Yeah, man. I mean like it's it things like that are slowly starting to happen more often. <laughs> uh, I I shudder to think 10 years from now in your shoes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. I'm 41 years old and I have a 3-year-old and a 2-year-old. I got a late start, so I'm I'm having to be a little bit younger acting as as I'm getting older. <laughs> right, right. So, uh I know that you guys before you guys got pairs going, which I want to get into some of the band talk. You had a band called The Lollies. What yes. uh, that that broke up like a year before you guys got the band going for pairs in 2014. Um, had you yeah. been in like a lot of bands? Um, I, you know, it's, that's a difficult question to answer because it, after a certain point, it's like, what even constitutes a band? Yeah. Is it like um, playing a gig or just jamming or whatever? Yeah. Right. All right. So, but I had been playing music with so many people for so long. Um, but, uh, as far as, uh, like real bands I was in, I kind of consider the lollies to be my first real band. Like you guys worked and like played shows out of town and did all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was like the f- and you know we put out a uh, we put out a record on a local label and like you know it, we did all the things that like a real band does. I had played you know in bands in my teenage years uh, and we would play like four shows and break up and yeah. never record a thing. Um, I so I mean I don't really consider that it's there's too many of those to even remember. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> So what, what caused the lollies to break up? Um, I think just, uh, it it was one of those things. It's like stagnance, you know? Yeah. Uh, we, we hadn't felt like we were doing anything for a long time. We didn't, we barely toured. Uh, and I think we did like two separate three week runs and that was about it. Um, and, uh, we had an album and we just kind of were playing a local show once a month and I don't know, it's kind of just felt dead. And what, I mean, forgive me, I haven't listened to, to the lollies. Was that kind of along the same lines as what you're doing now? Uh, in the same kind of world, it was far less like uh, hardcore oriented. Yeah. It was essentially, I mean, like, it's one of those records, like, you can start to hear that me and, and Predis were like developing our own identity as like as players. Yeah. But mostly it just sounds like propaganda worship. Uh, like <laughs> there's nothing it, wrong with that, man. Believe me. <laughs> no, no, sure. I mean, you, you could definitely pick w- way shittier bands to, to, to like emulate, yeah. Yeah. but it, it totally like the, the record kind of just sounds like uh, how to clean everything. Okay. Awesome. So that band broke up about a year later, 2014, you and Predis started pairs what was it like right. were you guys always just like the two good buddies that were in that band so you decided that you wanted to start this other band together or like how did that all come about no actually in the lollies like brian like never even showed up to rehearsal okay. so like when when he wanted to start another band i was I really i told him no like a billion times because <laughs> like i just wasn't into the idea of, of uh kind of doing the runaround and not really having anything come of it, you know? Uh, and if I was going to be in another band, I would want it to be something that was just fun. Uh, and, uh, so I don't know, eventually like I, I relented and I'm really glad I did. Cause I don't know what happened between the two projects. I mean, you know, I, you could figure like people just grow up, yeah, but, yeah. uh, Brian had like, f- he was fully determined to like, I mean, he is, has definitely always been the business side of the, the group. I feel like you have to kind of, I was always kind of that with my bands as well. And I I feel like there has to be kind of this balance between the artistic side and then someone in the band has to know how to order merch or send CDs to labels or something, right? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's really uh, like he, he knows how to do all that shit. He learned how to do all that shit seemingly overnight. Um, I can't imagine the hard work that that was in the, in the early, in, in the early couple of years, but, uh, but it was also, it had just a lot to do with the general, like, uh, uh, desire, you know, yeah, the desire to learn how to do those things, which I don't possess. Um, so I'm glad that he did. Um, <laughs> Well, you're the, you're the artistic side. That's that's the balance, right? Well, that's that's the cop out. But really, I think the the bottom line is that I'm just a fucking mess. <laughs> okay. uh, I I like to say, yeah, I'm just being the artist. Every band kind of needs to have a fucking mess, though, too. I think. I I think to an extent, you're absolutely right. I got to keep it on check. Yeah, know? right. <laughs> but uh, but but yeah, I think you're right. So you guys get the band going. Like I listen to a couple interviews. I always like to prepare a little bit before I talk to someone that I've not met before. Uh-huh. And what kept coming up in different interviews with you guys was that everything seemed to go so fast. And I mean, I, I think that some people you know, may, might have thought it was fast, but I'm sure there was a lot of determination and work put in, especially what you were just telling me about Brian. But how mm-hmm. soon after you formed did you guys release something? Oh, wow. I mean, uh, three months or four months. Wow. We put out Go to Prison. Wow. Um, Three or four yeah, months. It, that is kind of fast, I guess, when you think about it. It's really fucking fast, man. I mean, we recorded the album. When we had recorded the record, we hadn't been a band for a month yet. So what's the writing process like? I mean, especially back there in the beginning, like how were you guys putting songs together? Were, was someone coming in with a full song or were you guys kind of like doing it together at, at practice? We were kind of just doing it together and kind of like the, the idea was, you know, there are no bad ideas. Let's just string this shit together. Yeah. Um, which kind of like that sort of became how we ended up with these like hodgepodge songs that sounded like three songs, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just kind of saying yes to every ounce of material. Um, and when you, when you don't, uh, when you don't turn stuff away, it's easy to fucking write a record real quick. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> But uh, the, the, the process has definitely evolved over, over the years. And I think now we're, I mean, for Green Star, it was like an extremely selective process. Yeah. Uh, and then this last one uh, that, that it comes out, you know, next month was definitely, I think, some sort of like happy medium between the two. What, what is your process? I mean, since you're doing the vocals, I mean, for the most part, are you writing all the lyrics as well? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, or I mean, like, I think... Uh, a good, I would say like 95% of them. There have been a couple of times where it's just been, uh, too much of a, uh, I, I don't know. There's like a part that doesn't quite work. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Predus or somebody will re, uh, kind of finagle the words to, to fit in a more, I don't know, proper way. Um, but most of the time, yeah, I've, uh, I've written almost every single lyric for the band and that process is strange. Cause I mean, uh, the, the record we just did, I didn't have a single word written when we went into the studio Wow! and it's just kind of, I would just go outside and smoke a cigarette and kind of shit stuff out. Well, yeah, we talk about that on this podcast a lot too. Like, uh, some bands, you know, they just have this like complete vision for what the song's going to be. And then some bands kind of do the Metallica thing where you write the song and then you hum a melody with no words at all to get it down and then you write the words. So if you're in the studio, then are you hearing these songs that are already put together and then trying to come up with stuff? Um, it's kind of like it, the, the, the stuff kind of happens in tandem, okay. I would say, mostly. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on lyrics by the time that, that drums and bass are starting to get down. Uh, and in that time, like they're still figuring out the complete arrangements and like, you know, how many times this part has to happen. And I don't know, it, it really was kind of, uh, it was, uh, uh, very, very fluid. Yeah. Um, and the, it's kind of like, you know, we tried to as much as possible, just let the songs write themselves, uh, and, uh, make a decision and stick with it. Uh, try not to overthink things because green star had been like a heavily overthought record. And I mean, I can't, I, I'm happy with the way it came out completely. But the experience of making it was not, it was quite tedious and difficult. Uh, and I wasn't stoked to do that again. <laughs> so, I mean, and that was like the first actual full length that came out on fat, correct? Yeah. They had re-released Go to Prison, but okay. it was the first one that like came out on fat. So releasing Go to Prison three to four months into the band, how did you come to the attention of fat? Like, how did that happen? Because I mean, people in all these interviews said it was fast. I kind of downplayed that, but it seems a little fast, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think we owe that almost completely to Ryan Young. Okay. Um, he uh, he pressed the first uh, vinyl uh, version of Go to Prison uh, on his handle, Anxious and Angry. Okay. Um, and uh, I think for him, it was never like an end all. It was, I'm going to press the first round and try to find these guys a permanent home. Um, and so he really kind of like pushed us, uh, and he pushed us to a bunch of different people and fat just kind of seemed like a good match. Uh, and they were keen to do it. So, and th- the rest is history, I guess. So is it one of those stories that I get told on this podcast all the time? Because it's pretty fat heavy. I've got a good relationship with Vanessa. Shout out to Vanessa. Um, Yo, Vanessa. Yeah. Vanessa gave me the wrong phone number though. I will say. Yeah, that. I know. I haven't, I haven't told Vanessa my new phone number. How hilarious is awesome. that? Tell Jesus her, tell Christ. her right now. Nobody will call you. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right but uh yeah so signing with fat there's always that story of where like mike gives you a call like how did that all go down with you guys mike called uh me while i was on vacation uh and he called me at fucking one in the morning okay. and i honestly don't even remember the phone call because it was such like a bizarre experience <laughs> you know what i mean like i, I kind of just blacked out and then hung up and went what just happened <laughs> did, did you believe that it was him yeah, I did. I did. I mean, you know, because once you know, like you're signing the fat, it's like it's not that uh, uh, out outrageous to yeah, think yeah. that the uh, that he's going to call you. Yeah, <laughs> one of the owners of the label might call you. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, I always revert back to this story. I played in a band called the Ataris, and uh, our oh our, fuck yeah, yeah, our right. singer Chris, when he actually like got signed back in the day. This is way before I was in the picture, but he had he had gone to see. I think the queers and the vandals in Cincinnati. And he gave a demo tape to Joe Escalante from the vandals who owns Kung Fu. And like a year and a half later at like seven in the morning, he gets a phone call at his mom's house from Joe and he hung up on him like three (laughs) times because he didn't. This is before cell phones and shit. No email. This is like an old school landline. And he hung up on him three times. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just always thought that was funny. So when people tell me like, oh, we signed a fat and like, there's no story. I'm always like, there's gotta be something like the, with Mike calls or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, it definitely, it definitely happened. I definitely don't really remember what was spoken of. Yeah. Um, but it was like, okay, this is a, uh, it, it did make it feel like real. Yeah. And it's also like this thing where like, you know, what's going to fucking happen now. Yeah, because you, you never know. I mean, in the climate of how the music industry is, I mean, if you guys signed with fat in the nineties, you would have probably, you know, bought houses. I would have, yeah, I would have gone back to school, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you were talking about kind of the added scrutiny on, you know, Green Star with, with the first, like, full release on Fat that wasn't a re-release. Do you think the whole, like, the idea of being on Fat and kind of did it add some anxiety and you guys wanted to make sure that it was, like, the right release? Um, it definitely added a metric fuck ton of anxiety. Uh, it was the first time we've ever written a record that we knew people were going to hear. Okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it changes a lot, but, uh, I kind of like the mantra for me has always been like, you know, uh, our guts got us here. Yeah. So why stop trusting them now? Yeah. Totally. So really it was like the, the whole process was about ignoring that, that, uh, pressure, uh, and just kind of doing what felt natural. Um, yeah. How how hands on was Fat while you guys were in the studio with that record? Because I, I've kind of heard conflicting stuff. Sometimes they're very involved. Sometimes they're not. Um. Yeah. No. I think there. At one point, there was a version uh, of the the way things were going to play out. Like Mike was going to like kind of produ- produce the pre production yeah. uh, stuff, you know, and kind of like get uh, write notes about the tunes. And in our classic fashion, we just. Uh, didn't do that shit enough uh, in, in time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, we kind of, but, but right before we went into the studio, we sent the tunes over to, uh, to Mike and he was like, I, I think these are kind of good to go. Awesome. And so uh, we just kind of went for it. That's awesome, man. So you've got this new record coming out on March 6th on fat yeah. records. Uh, it's the third full length. And I was wondering, is it self-titled or is it three? Because there's a three on the on the co- cover. Right. It is self-titled, but I love that there's the little three on it. Yeah, uh, that's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's the self-titled uh, record. I think it was just like, I felt like whatever we were going to do this time was going to end up being pretty definitive for us. Yeah. Like kind of, we've 
now like trudge through like uh, the the woods of like what we want to be as a group and we've found like what we sound like completely um and uh and yeah it turned out that way it definitely feels more definitive and more us than i anything we've done so you guys worked with chris fogel of the, the gamuts out in denver I, his production yes. is just stellar man like uh, I love how it. was it being in the studio with him uh, it was fucking fantastic, and I knew it would be because we had just done the, or me and Brian Wallstrom had just done the Band Aid Brigade record there. Okay, which awesome, is, man. which is how we had decided, or I had like decided to go and do this record with Chris as well. I just came home from that first experience and told the Pairs guys like, "Yo, this guy uh, is just wonderful, and he has he's patient and creative, has a great ear. Um, we should, we need to go there." Uh, and it was fucking fantastic. I mean, I liked it. I'm about to go cut another solo record with Chris awesome, um, in like a couple of weeks. So uh, tell me a little bit about the Band-Aid Brigade, because I, I saw some stuff on the Internet about that, but I, I, I don't know much about it. Could you fill me in on like, was that going pre pairs or was that something that started kind of after? Oh, it started after. Um, it was, uh, I guess, a product of the uh one week records tour oh yeah yeah joey joey was on the show uh, about a couple months ago man he was talking all about one week records mm -hmm. so i had done a record on one week records in uh 2016 i did one uh and then i went uh i started doing tours with joey from time and again you know whenever we could both do it um and uh and on one particular tour it was uh joey uh donald spence brian wallstrom and i okay um, and me and Brian, uh, just kind of hit it off and, uh, had a lot of, shared a lot of the same, uh, musical tastes. And, uh, I think we just started, uh, liking the idea of like kind of mining our collective interests of like rock and pop over the ages and trying to write something that, um, that was in a way nostalgic, but also, uh, I mean, the, the way that I always put it is it's like we took everything that we liked from previous decades of rock music and pop music and kind of did away with the shit that we didn't like. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Genesis is wonderful, but every Genesis song is like five minutes longer than it needs to be. Yeah, That's a great yeah. example totally. of, of, you know, what we tried to change. And I, I don't know. I'm really excited with the way it came out. That record came out, uh, last month. Awesome, man. Um, yeah. And, uh, I think we're going to do, uh, much more. And as far as the solo stuff, like you said, you did a, a solo record on one week. You're getting ready mm -hmm. to go do another solo record. Uh, what label is that going to be on? Or is this going to be like self-released? Uh, not sure yet. Uh, not sure yet. Uh, but uh, it's going to be a different kind of thing. The one week record was true to one week form. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a bare, like acoustic record. This, on the other hand, is going to be like... Uh, it, it's an electric record. It'll, it'll be a punk record. Awesome. Um, but I'm, it, it kind of like uh, punk in the way that uh, Wire and The Wipers and uh, that early sort of like art punk. Yeah. Um, that's kind of, I'm thinking what it's going to be. Devo a little too. Okay, awesome, man. Yeah. Well, I, I also, when I was looking around for stuff on the internet, I saw that uh, one of your Bridge City Sessions videos where you did that Cindy Lauper cover time after time. I got to say that was great, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think I'm going to record that. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if I'll flesh out a full arrangement of it or just leave it just guitar and vocals. How how was that experience for the one week records thing? Because Joey said it kind of changed over time. Like it used to be it had to be done in seven days and then it had to be like, well, the tracking had to be done in seven days. So was yours true right. to form? Um, it was the tracking was done in seven days. Okay. Um, and it was back when he was doing them in his basement. Okay. Um, but, uh, we actually, uh, that was, I think right around when he started to be a little more lax with the formula, because at first I was only going to do an EP. Um, and it he was going to call it a weekend record, which is something that he had done before. Um, but I went out there and we had so much fun making half of a record. We were just like, let's do another half. So, I went back out for another like three days. Um, so we did it in chunks, but it's still one week. Well, that's, that's awesome, man. And to anybody out there that doesn't know one week records is basically at the beginning, it was everything had to be done in one week, but then he, right. st he started to get a little lax as it went on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it is really kind of like, that's some tough shit. It's tough. And yeah. 
I mean, now, if there's anybody that can do it, it's him because he is a tough motherfucker in the studio. Oh, yeah. Um, he's, he, uh, I mean, I think at one point, my favorite, uh, my favorite quote uh, from Joey to me during those sessions was, who taught you how to sing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, Was he, the answer I mean, nobody? <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, really, the funnier uh pretty true answer would have been you motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> but uh but he really gets the best out of the people that he works with and he's got a you know he, he kind of has a an ear for the full picture even when you don't yeah um which is pretty helpful essentially considering that you're trying to do a whole thing in one week oh yeah yeah totally man. yeah well this this show is about touring i i, I try to hit a lot of different areas but um <clears throat> I, I'm friends with some of the guys in Rise Against, and I know you guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know you guys toured with them back uh, a couple years ago, and I know that it was also with Sleeping with Sirens. Yeah, you might have got this question quite a bit. I mean, I can see you guys touring with Rise Against, but Sleeping with Sirens seems like that's kind of an odd band to have on that tour. And I know they <laughs> they have a lot of fans. I know this was over mm-hmm. in Europe. Like, what was the reaction for you guys as the opener on that tour? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever if you've ever tried to imagine what a uh, uh, room with seventeen thousand people in it, yeah, being quiet, <laughs> 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 that's kind of what it was like. Uh, I, I just I think that what it comes down to is uh, the uh, the the shared base between Rise Against and Sleeping with Sirens because they do have like there's plenty of crossover because Rise Against is so massive. Yeah, there's a there's a definite Venn diagram of Rise Against and probably Nickelback or any other band, right? Right, right. Any like bands that are essentially like on the uh, on like commercial radio yeah, steadily. Yeah. Uh, and so I think the it, main issue was that in that Venn diagram where Sleeping with Sirens and Rise Against crossed over. <laughs> There really wasn't any pairs <laughs> in there. <laughs> yeah. Like I think I think had it been like uh had it been Rise Against and then like another fucking like fat or epitaph punk band and us, yeah. it would have been like a completely different experience. But uh it w- we were a tough sell on that tour. <laughs> so do you have any little tidbits from that tour? Like, did you guys try to win them over or did you just go out there and just say, fuck you, we're just gonna do our thing? Uh we I mean, like, you know, I I don't know how trying to win someone over with pairs i don't know what that would even look like <laughs> <Yeah>. it's <laughs> it's kind of so brash that it's like i don't know you're either gonna get it or you don't and often it felt like they didn't yeah um but i mean at the same time just like any other tour we still have uh people that come to see us that first saw us because of that tour um yeah i'm sure there's there i'm sure there's a lot of people there that totally dug it i just when i saw that i almost thought it was a typo i'm like I can see Rise Against and Sleeping with Sirens, and I can see Rise Against in pairs. It just seemed like such a weird trio, you know? Right. It was it was a strange trio. Now, at the same time, I mean, we just had a fucking blasty blast hanging out with both of those bands. Like, oh, yeah, I mean, I, I know I know Nick from Sleeping with Sirens. He used to be in. I used to play in a band uh, with him called Undermined. I played bass for a while for them. So, like, yeah, they're all my buddies are in those bands. I just thought it was such an odd pairing. <laughs> Yeah, no, it totally is a fucking odd pairing. But me and me and Kellen still chit chat every once in a while. I mean, we share the Quinn moniker, so that's uh, awesome. And my favorite story from that tour was I ran into a girl outside of a show who was crying because she had just met Kellen. Okay, like she she must have been like thirteen or yeah, something, you yeah, know? Yeah, uh, and she was crying because she had just met Kellen. And I asked her if I could get a picture with her. <laughs> so I got a picture with a girl that was crying because she met Kellen Quinn. Did did you did you like? So you wanted to just have the picture because it was funny. But did you say you wanted the picture with her because she met Kellen? Uh, I I just I, I I literally just told her like I want a picture with you because you're crying because you just met oh, Kellen you- Quinn. <laughs> I thought that would have been really funny if you would have just been like, oh, you met him. I got to get a picture with I you. I got to get a picture with you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but so, and then she, obviously it's great because she, she thought that was funny uh, and she took the picture with me. So she's just like tears all over her face, but laughing. 
<laughs> That's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the, one of the coolest pictures I've ever taken. Well, I've also, I, I was looking around for some stuff, and I saw, you know, when you go to your Wikipedia page, there's quite a few me- ex-members. If you go to the Atari's page, I'm like the f- seventh guitar player, so I totally understand <laughs> that. <laughs> right. But uh, what I saw on there was is that Chris and Rob from Strung Out actually filled in on bass for you guys when you guys were in Australia and New Zealand. Is Can you give me, like, the rundown on that? Oh, God, that tour. Oh, my God. That was the worst but also super fucking fun yeah i mean what what essentially what happened was our bass player at the time had like a meltdown and didn't show up wow um and so we're just like on a plane to australia without a bass player (laughs) um and i mean like it was it was quite a fucking experience and then like i think a week into that tour i shattered my wrist yeah, that, that was actually, I, I got to give a shout out. I always ask uh, my listeners to ask questions. Dan from Australia, he was like, what happened to your arm while you were on tour with Strung Out in Australia? So there you go, Dan. <laughs> He's going to answer right now. Okay. Yeah, I I, I, I did the Iron Man landing. Okay. Uh, and if you're not familiar with what that is, uh, I jumped as high as I could in the air and landed with the fist down. Ooh. Um, and I didn't pull the punch. Uh, so I did it, uh, just in the spirit of the moment and then just felt everything just kind of crumble. Wow. Um, and so I just finished the set with my like stupid crinkly hand dangling at my side (laughs) and then walked off the stage right up to the TM and was like, I need to go to the hospital. So I, I have a question about that. You know, me, the other countries in the world that have universal health care. Like when I was on tour in Canada one time, I had strep throat and I went to the doctor mm-hmm. and got free medicine and everything was fine. So what's the process like that when you were an American in Australia and you shatter your arm? Well, it was fucking incredible. And I didn't get completely free coverage because yeah. I'm not a citizen. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so the first hurdle kind of was that we had to be in a different city every day. Yeah. And so for a while it was like every day we'd get so far in the hospital, but then they'd be, uh, we'd get somewhere in a new city and they'd be like, no, we have to do our own x-rays. We have to do, you know, uh, so it'd be like starting from scratch. So I just kind of bumbled around with a bunch of broken bones in my arm for like uh, a week. Wow. Uh, but then finally, uh, we, uh, we managed to get, uh, like copies of the x-rays from somebody who wasn't supposed to do that. But like, I guess, uh, felt bad about our situation. Um, and so we brought it to another hospital where they also weren't supposed to accept those and they did. Um, and I was able to get the surgery. Um, now, uh, multiple emergency room visits, surgery and a follow-up appointment all ended up costing me 900 bucks. That's insane, yeah. man. That's for, awesome. Yeah, as an American, you know how crazy that is. Yeah, it's insane, <laughs> man. It's fucking bonkers. And uh, apparently, the uh, the people who uh, do work on like carpels and, and hands out there are, are like some of the best in the world. Yeah, I have absolutely no problems with my hand or wrist now. That, that's crazy, man. So you, you didn't have a bass player. You shatter your wrist. Mm-hmm. Did anything else happen on that tour that was kind of like, it seems cursed a little bit? Uh, oh, it definitely was. But I mean, I think it was just uh, nothing else really major happened. Um, and then, you know, uh, about a week and a half in, uh, Pat from The Decline, um, they were on Bird Attack, uh, might still be, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, he started filling in on bass and he filled in for the rest of the tour. Okay. So things kind of hit this stride of almost normalcy after yeah. a certain point. Yeah. And really, I just feel really good about like, I mean, we kind of, we made it through that tour, regardless of how weird or dumpy some of those shows might've been because we're trying to play with a bass player who barely knows the fucking songs or, you know, or like my arm is fucked up. My wrist is broken. And I don't know, as weird as some of those shows might've been, we survived, got home and fucking kept going. Were you guys doing ground transport or were you guys flying from city to city? Because in Australia, man, those drives are brutal. We were flying quite often. I think that's, um, that's the best way to do it over there. Yeah. And they actually had to give me just like a half closed uh, cast because of uh, the fact that I had to be on an airplane uh, constantly. Uh, because like, you know, your, uh, your, your limbs will swell. Yeah. 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 So, uh, 
Yeah, but um, yeah, lots of flying. And then they gave me the fucking hydrocodone, and that was just like a three day vacation. Um, <laughs> awesome. I mean, I was just like high as a kite for three days, absolutely abusing the shit, but uh, it was wonderful. Well, I tell you what, man, I've had you on the phone for quite a while. I- I'd like to know what you guys have coming up in the future. I've seen some, it's a lot of tour dates coming up in March, and I know you guys are planning yeah. on kind of going all over the world. Like, what do you guys have coming up? Um, coming up, we have uh, we have the uh, the the first part of the U.S. tour, which is like a month from March to April, uh, and then we've got what we've got uh, punk rock bowling, uh, and then Australia, uh, and then we're working on uh, the first round of uh, book uh, booking the first round of Europe right now, um, but we are gonna go fucking all over the place. Is there any place that you haven't been to yet that you're just dying to go to? Yes, man. I want to go to Hong Kong so bad. Probably not the best time. <laughs> yeah, it's not um, the best time, but Hong Kong is amazing, man. I have never been and I want to go. I mean, I generally just fucking it, anywhere. I, I have, I've never been to Asia. Okay. So, uh, that, well, I'm anywhere. sure you guys will go to Japan, man. The fat bands do great over there. You'll get over there. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. We, we're actually, uh, we're going to make a point of doing that this year. We still haven't made it out and we will. Have have you guys talked at all about Central or South America? Because I know Strung Out and Pennywise and those bands do amazing down there. I've been down there with some of my old bands, and it's just it's a whole other world down there, man. Yeah, uh, I mean, we absolutely have talked about it. We really want to get down there because, it, it, in fact, we get more streams and sell more records in Chile than anywhere else in the world. Um, well, we are <laughs> we are currently the number one music podcast in Chile, so I think it's going to even get bigger right now. Oh, killer. Well, everybody down there, uh, <laughs> hi, and we'll see you hopefully soon. Yeah, I, I don't know why. Like, we, we do really well all over the world. We have, like, 95 to, uh, like, 100 countries that listen. But every week when I put out an episode, Chile, we're number one. I have no idea why. That's fucking killer. And, yeah. I mean, I, 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 can, I can I share the similar sentiment. I have no idea why, but we're, we're, we, we do really well, uh, at, you know, at least in theory down there. Got to get down there yeah you, you got to get down there it's great down there so the new record is self-titled record or three mm-hmm. is coming out on march 6th on fat do you guys have like a big release show planned i know that that first date i saw is in new orleans yeah that's going to be the kind of official release even though it's three weeks after the album comes out okay. um, that'll be like the release show so to speak awesome man well uh would you like to plug anything else like the socials for the band or anything um, I mean, no, it's all pretty straightforward. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Stay, stay up to date. Uh, follow me on Instagram, Zach Quinstagram to get like, to stay up to date with all of my projects. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, dude, it, it was great. And if you guys come through Indianapolis, we're going to hang out. Okay. Hell yeah. Sounds great. Awesome. Well, I'll talk to you later, Zach. Have a great tour. Good luck with the record and come back and talk to us when that new solo disc is done. Okay. All right, buddy. We'll do. Awesome. Thanks Talk a to lot. you later, man. Bye. Bye. So there it was. My conversation with Zach Quinn from the awesome band Pairs. I love their new record so much. The self-titled Pairs record or three, if you'd like to call it three. It does have a three on the label. But uh, it came out at the beginning of the month on Fat Records. You guys can get it now. It's on all the streaming sites. It's on YouTube. Uh, you can pick up a physical copy, vinyl, whatever you want over at fatrec.com. And... That's it for this week. Thank you so much. Shout out to Zach again. Thanks for coming on. Hope you're doing okay down in New Orleans. I know you guys are quote unquote one of the new hot spots. So I hope you're staying healthy and you're staying inside. And I hope to be, get to talk to you real soon, my man. And that's it for this week. I want to say that uh, this is episode 99, which you guys know what that means. Next week, it's a big one. Episode 100. We are in the triple digits. I've been doing this podcast now for almost two years. We're going to hit that milestone. I was doing some some reading online about podcasts, and uh, it says that only like 3% of podcasts that are started globally hit the 100-episode milestone. So I'd like to thank everybody that's been on this ride with me uh, since the beginning. Some of you guys have been emailing me and saying stuff to me since like episode two or three. So thank you so much. I'm going to continue to do this. I love it so much, and I love the community that I've become a part of with this and just meeting other podcasters and 
and talking to all you guys from all over the world. It's it's really cool and it means everything to me. And speaking of other podcasters, episode 100 is my sit down chat with Mr. Dewey Halpus from the Peer Pleasure Podcast a network mate over on Jabberjaw. But uh, I went out to Oregon a few weeks ago before all hell broke loose and we couldn't leave our house. I went to Oregon to visit some family and uh, I met this really cool guy that listens to the show named Mark and he was my chauffeur, my tour guide and drove me from Corvallis where my aunt lives all the way to Portland to hang out with Dewey. We went out and got some lunch and then we went back to Dewey's house. I got to meet his family and everything. And we set up in his garage and we did a really cool like hour and a half chat about music and podcasting and all kinds of cool stuff. And uh, you guys are gonna have to wait till next week for that. Like I said, episode 100. I'm so stoked. I never thought I was going to get to 100 episodes and uh, it, it, it happened. It's pretty, pretty cool. And I've got, I think, almost the next 15 episodes planned out. So it's going to we're just going to keep rolling. And thank you so much for coming on this journey with me. It means everything. Speaking of doing this for two years, if you remember the one year number 52 that we did last year, it was an Ask Chris episode co-hosted by my awesome, amazing, beautiful wife, Felicia Swinney. And uh, Felicia is going to come back for episode 104, which is going to be here in about a month or so. And I'm going to do some more a round of questions. So if you guys have questions, you can hit me up all the socials. It's at T-O-T-O-T podcast, or you can email T-O-T-O-T podcast at gmail.com. Ask your questions. You can ask Felicia questions as well. I will ask her the questions on the show. Last time it was a lot more questions for me, but uh, I actually got a lot of feedback and you guys liked her. Some of you guys liked her better than me. So uh, you can ask her questions also. Anything you guys want. So episode 104 is going to be the Ask Chris and Felicia episode. And I hope you guys are excited as I am and send in some cool questions and we'll get it done. We'll get it taken care of. So as always, if you guys are feeling generous, you don't want to do the Patreon, you don't want to do any of that stuff, you don't want to sponsor episodes, uh, just make a donation to the Venmo. It really helps this show get going. It's uh, at Christopher Swinney. It helps out even if it's 50 cents, a dollar, whatever. It'll help me out with my equipment and everything that it takes to do this podcast. So if you're feeling, if you're feeling generous, hit up my virtual tip jar, Venmo, at Christopher Swinney. So make sure you guys are self-quarantining, social distancing, Stay safe, stay healthy, just stay home. We got to get through this and together we can get through it. But there is no shortage of really cool content out there that is being created because we're all stuck at home. So go search it out and support your favorite musicians, your favorite podcasts, anybody that's doing something cool and creative that is entertaining you. Make sure to support them. And that's it for this week. I'm going to leave you with uh, the new single from the new self-titled Pairs record. It is entitled Comfortably Dumb. It's really cool. There's a great video on YouTube, so make sure you check that out. But I'm going to jump out of here, and I will see you guys next week for episode 100 with my good buddy, Mr. Dewey Halpus from the Peer Pleasure Podcast. And while you're at it, go listen to some of Dewey's stuff, man. His episodes are awesome. And if you like my show, you'll, you're really going to dig Dewey's show. So I will see you guys next week. This is Pears with Comfortably Dumb. Peace.
Hey guys, it's Alice Lenny. And I see you. That's what I utter. This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network.